Okay, I'm here today to talk about the clinical application of virtual reality. Now, virtual reality has undergone a transition the last 20 years. It's taken it essentially from realm of expensive toy into that of functional technology. I'll spend the next 10 or so minutes, and I'm going to try to keep it to 10, um, showing some of the applications we've developed over those years. But I have to go back in time a little bit. Um, in 1991, I was working as a clinical psychologist in a brain injury rehab program. We worked with folks that had significant head trauma from motor vehicle accidents, stroke, neurological conditions. And we basically tried to do cognitive rehab and help them to reacquire their thinking abilities and their ability to get on with life and everyday functioning. Um, one day during a break, one of my clients, a 21-year-old male named Tim, I uh, was sitting under a tree, and he was bent over something. And I walked up to him, and I said, Tim, what's, what's going on? Are you okay? He goes, it's a new thing. It's a Game Boy. And I go, wow, what does it do? And, you know, I didn't, Game Boys had just come out, and I hadn't seen one. And he goes, watch. And I watched him, and he was glued to this thing. And this is a, a guy I couldn't motivate for more than five minutes on a traditional rehab task. And he was glued to this thing. He was engaged and he was becoming a Tetris warlord. Um, <laughs> and it showed that he could benefit from this. I don't know how much Tetris would help him in everyday life, but it showed that and at that moment the thought came, what if we could put rehabilitation tasks in an engaging format like this that would get people to actually do it? So I happened to have gotten a Nintendo 64 um, for my 37th birthday. My mom still thought I should get a toy for Christmas. And uh, it had SimCity with it. And I don't know if you ever played that, but it's a great cognitive stimulating game. You have to plan a strategy, initiate it, monitor it, repair the strategy, keep going. I brought that in, and my clients loved it. They were like ducks to water. They were building cities and getting engaged, doing things that they would never do with traditional paper and pencil kinds of workbook exercises. Um, so that's when the idea started to, to really form. Virtual reality had popped into the public consciousness around the same time. Lawnmower Man, Disney Quest, which was Disney's effort to put a theme park in a building with virtual reality rides, which actually failed. Um, a lot of startups, and it was like the heyday, the first coming of virtual reality, if you will. Uh, so I thought, what if we take virtual reality and game-like things and put it all together and build rehab tasks um, that would be fun and engaging and get people to actually do the work. So at the time, computing was very expensive to do this. It was like a $200,000 uh, computer, a silicon graphics reality engine was needed. Um, I was still using my compact desk pro with a 20 megabyte hard drive, pushing word star and word perfect. For all you older folks out there, you'll remember those programs. Um, and so I made the decision uh, to uh, take a postdoc at USC in 1995, just so I could make friends with computer scientists that had the equipment, had the programming knowledge, and try to convince them this might be a way to go. And it worked. I was, I, all of a sudden, I had a lab. Um, but it was 1995, and it was the start of the nuclear winter of virtual reality. The public enchantment had faded. People tried VR, and it kind of sucked. Um, you know, it was, um, the technology just wasn't there to deliver on the overhyped um, vision. But the vision was sound. And um, so we kept our heads down. And over the last 20 years, since 1995, uh, we started building applications for a range of purposes. And I'm going to talk about some of those today and show some of them. Um, and I'm going to focus initially just on a couple of things we developed in the lab over the years, uh, across a range of areas, and focus on um, our work treating post-traumatic stress disorder in returning Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. Um, now, our lab over the years has focused on these three areas and working now with artificially intelligent virtual humans. And this is a video clip of what you'll see in a minute. 
uh, for treating PTSD. It'll make some sense in a, in a second, but you can see it's like a video game. And it's what you'd see in a virtual reality headset as you navigate down an alley in Afghanistan. That's what it looked like a couple of years ago. You can see the difference in the graphics, but we actually we use the same application to test attention, memory, multitasking ability in a simulated environment. We've also done non-military apps. This is a visual spatial application for testing mental uh, rotation abilities. And this is a virtual classroom we developed for assessing attention skills in kids with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So you can see the child has to pay attention to the board, but meanwhile there's distractions and we can test how well they can stay focused while the teacher goes out the door and kid just through a paper airplane and all the, the challenges of a, a real classroom. We've also built things with the Microsoft Connect uh, for physical rehabilitation. So the idea being without any wires or heavy instrumentation, the camera is tracking her movement and putting it in a game-like context so that physical therapy might be not so boring and repetitive, it might be fun like a game. Finally, I'm gonna show a very brief clip of a virtual human, artificially intelligent virtual human serving the role as a patient and a social worker is interacting with this patient. And essentially what you're gonna see is uh, a project that aims to give novice clinicians the opportunity to practice and perhaps screw up a bunch with a digital patient before they get their hands on a live one. Good afternoon, Sergeant Castilla. What brings you in today? Well, my wife told me she thought I should talk to someone. She's been pretty concerned about me since a soldier suicide on base last week. Did you happen to know the soldier? Yes. He wasn't a friend, but I met the Marine once or twice. He seemed normal at the time. I guess I'm afraid I might end up like him. So you get the idea here. I know the, vo the sound isn't so good on that. Um, but we've also used, and you'll see this guy a little bit later, um, we've used AI and virtual humans to deliver healthcare information on the web. And I'll just let Bill introduce himself. You'll see more of him later. Well, I'm not a real person, if that's what you're asking. But I'm based on the personality and experiences of real soldiers and Marines. I'm still just a piece of software, but I'm getting better all the time. So hopefully I can be a helpful piece of software to talk to. So with that, we know we have a significant mental health challenge on our hands and a responsibility, a duty, a moral obligation to look after our service members that have fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. The numbers are staggering, and we need to address this. Um, so one method is with virtual reality. And I'm gonna run a quick clip, because I think I can do it in, not, in 40 seconds with this clip, rather than trying to explain it myself. And I think it'll, it'll make sense of the idea. BraveMind is a form of virtual reality exposure therapy that combines video game-based simulations with one of the most widely used evidence-based therapies. Making use of the University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies, expertise in immersive technologies and emotional storytelling, BraveMind is a treatment option with appeal for today's digital generation. BraveMind gradually recreates trauma-relevant scenarios that clinicians can use to help patients confront and process difficult memories in a safe and supportive environment. So you saw the clinician on the left. The clinician controls everything that goes on in the simulation. You can change the time of day, the weather, the lighting, uh, the ambient sounds can blow stuff up. And you're probably thinking, why the hell would you do that to somebody with PTSD? But in actuality, this form of treatment, this graduated confrontation and processing of difficult emotional memories is probably the best evidence-based approach, has the best scientific data for curing or easing the pain of PTSD. And I want to show a couple of clips of the types of scenarios that you can put people in, and you'll hear a patient talk about their experience. <laughs> Wait for movement. 
by going through it there, it's not going through my head at night when I'm trying to right. sleep or when I'm with my wife, when times when I don't want it to, to come up and me start thinking about it. Traumatic things are not normal. You cannot handle the, the things that we've seen and done. And this is a tool that has helped me out tremendously. Reliving the worst moments of his life has helped him to move on with his life. I'm probably about 80% of who I was before I left. But I think that's pretty good after seeing and doing the things that we've done. For Nightline, this is Dan Harris in Atlanta. So I hope that kind of clears up that we're not like re-traumatizing people. We're helping them to confront and process very difficult emotional memories. Now, we also have data. This was one study where we see PTSD symptoms at the beginning of treatment, at the end of treatment, and at three-month follow-up. And to put a finer point on it, 16 of that 20 in that sample no longer met PTSD criteria at the end of treatment. Four didn't benefit from uh, the approach. Now, I think that, you know, we all agree war sucks, but it does drive innovation. And I think that we're going to see virtual reality evolve into civilian applications for trauma, wide range of trauma that's not related to war. Um, and as we see, the stats here are compelling. I think we need stuff like this. Now, one other application that we've developed in a similar vein is designed to break down what we call barriers to care. And in the military, stigma is a big issue. Um, service members particularly don't want to admit they have a problem. We're hoping it gets to the day where going to see a shrink about an anxiety issue is like going to the dentist when you have a toothache. There's no shame in it. You know, Christ, you're going to war. So this was designed as a way that people could, that were hesitant to seek care with a life provider, could interact with a virtual human online and find out about PTSD, do some light self-assessment, get information, and maybe put a toe in the water, inch a little bit closer towards seeking help with a live provider uh, that they could benefit from. Um, so that just sort of summarizes it. I want to underscore, though, we're not providing therapy. We're not replacing clinicians. It's not a doc in a box. So I'll let uh, Bill describe it to you. Hi there. The name's William Ford, but you can call me Bill. Welcome to SimCoach. Hi, Bill. So what's SimCoach? SimCoach is a safe place for war fighters and their families to talk about the things that are on their minds. So who are you? I'm a virtual human, which means that I'm based on the real experiences and personalities of actual war fighters and their families. Anyway, I'm here to listen, and I'm here to help. Anything you want to talk about? Talk to you? How do I do that? Well, you're doing it right now. Just type in regular English. Anything troubling you? If there is, why would I want to talk to you about it? Well, here, I'll tell you what. I made a video that tells you a little bit more. I'm going to pop it up over here on the right. Not all the wounds of war are physical. When you don't dress a wound, it gets worse, doesn't it? SimCoach is here to talk about the issues weighing on your mind without worrying about anyone finding out about it. You start off by choosing the SIM coach that's right for you. Oh, hi. Hope you weren't waiting long. Welcome to SIM coach. I'm Ellie. Then just type in English. Ellie can listen, understand, and respond. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask a few questions so I can figure out how to help you better. Is that okay? Everything you say here is completely anonymous, and we've taken a lot of steps to keep it that way. If you don't mind my asking, how's your sleeping been lately? Here's a link on the do's and don'ts of good sleep hygiene. Ellie can send you links to resources, show you a video, administer questionnaires, give you advice, or just tell you a story. So my younger brother Alex was in the Marines and deployed twice. I don't want to say I know what he went through, because I don't. But something he said kind of reminded me of something you might be going through. But the most important thing she'll do is listen to yours. That must have been really rough. Go ahead and tell me more about that, if you can. SimCoach was developed by a whole group of docs, computer geeks, experts, and writers to be as helpful as possible. And the more the people use it, the better it's getting all the time. SimCoach. 
a safe place to talk to someone at a time when it's needed most. So, I, you know, again, we look to civilian translation. So that same architecture now is being used at the Dan Marino Foundation to help high-functioning people on the autistic spectrum learn job interviewing skills. So that actually these characters conduct job interviews and we can control um, the different characters, the different types of jobs, and the personality type of the job interviewer. You know, the soft touch, the neutral, and that stress interviewer that you still have nightmares about. We can, we can deliver those. And we also got to sign football from Dan. Um, anyway, um, I just want to close by saying I, I think that, um, that virtual reality technology really has evolved into a a functional tool that can really make a difference in medical areas and clinical areas, but the work in, um, in service member health and uh, veteran care, I think, is, is, is really where my heart is right now. And it, it came about uh, from something long-standing. I, I grew up in a, a small town in Connecticut, and we had a veteran's home and hospital. It was kind of up on a hill, and it was a farm town. And uh, they would bring the veterans down. These were World War II's in the, in the early 60s when I was a kid. And they'd bring the veterans down in a blue bus and drop them off in our little town center. And they'd leave the bus and run to the liquor store, go off into the woods, have little campments, or run to the bar. And the bus would come back around 8 o'clock at night and pick them up, and they were all pretty wasted. And as a kid, we'd be pedaling our bikes around and didn't know what was going on, you know, with these guys. We didn't have, we had John Wayne movies, you know, the heroism of war that guided how we thought about war. And I made friends with a couple of these guys. Uh, one guy had a, a transistor radio that was the size of a boombox in 1961. We used to listen to Yankee games in front of the post office. And one time, um, it's really hard for me to tell this story, I was with my dad going through, um, going through town, and I saw the guy passed out. And I said, Dad, I know that guy. What's going on? He said, that, that's a man that was hurt by war. I don't want to get all political, but men, women get hurt by war. And we need to do the best thing we can when they get back to take care of them. And I hope this technology is a step in that direction. Thank you.